Good afternoon, everyone. We're about to start on our fourth hearing this morning, and I have to find the correct one. Uh, yes. Yes. And um, this hearing is hearing number 16 of the period of sessions, and it is on the impact of gun violence in the United States. It was requested by a number of civil society groups. And uh, we will have, we will distribute the time in this way, 15 minutes to civil society and 15 minutes to the state. And we will try to squeeze in our comments and questions in eight minutes. Um, and you will have a short time to do closing remarks. Um, with that, I am happy to welcome the state and to welcome all of you, and I invite you to commence your presentations. Hello, I am Jasmeet Sidhu, senior researcher with Amnesty International USA, focusing on the impact of US gun violence on human rights. Thank you for granting this important hearing. The gun violence crisis in the United States is a human rights crisis for those who are killed and for those left behind. The commission heard last year about the U.S.'s consistent failure to regulate guns at the Bogota sessions. The focus of today's hearings is the scars of survival, the impact of gun violence on survivors. Since last year's hearing, gun violence rates have continued to increase. On average, 109 people in the United States, including six children and youth, are killed every single day. Our first witness today is Ryan Deitch, a survivor of last year's shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, where 17 of his classmates and teachers were killed. The U.S. is also failing to protect women at risk of domestic violence by allowing their abusers easy access to firearms. As a result, women like Laura White, who will testify today, are exposed to grave harm. Laura's abuser should never have had a gun, but he shot her point blank and nearly killed her. It is important to note that U.S. gun homicides disproportionately affect communities of color. African Americans are 10 times more likely to be victims of gun homicides than white Americans. And gun violence is the leading cause of death among black men ages 15 to 34. Today we will hear from Gregory Jackson, an African American man who was shot in Washington, D.C. We will also hear from Cleopatra Pendleton, whose daughter Hadia, an honor student in Chicago, was gunned down and killed at the age of just 15 years old. Moreover, those who survive gun violence face a lifetime of pain and expense. Dr. Lori Punch, a trauma surgeon, will join us via video to share her firsthand experience treating gunshot victims. This is not just a U.S. crisis, however. Throughout the Americas, U.S. firearms are driving gun violence beyond the border through both legal and illegal channels. Don Antonio Tizapa will join us via video to describe how U.S. assault rifles were used in the kidnapping of 43 students in Ayotzinapa. As the U.S. seeks to weaken laws governing firearm exports, we must take into account that these guns are being used to perpetrate human rights abuses at home and abroad. With only 5% of the world's population, the U.S. has almost half of the world's civilian-owned guns. In the face of the sheer volume of and easy access to guns, the U.S. government has clear obligations to protect, respect, and fulfill people's human rights, including the rights to live, the rights to life, security of person, and to be free from discrimination. Thank you, and with this, I will turn it over to Ryan Deitch. Hello, my name is Ryan Deitch, and I thank you for granting me this opportunity to speak and share my story with you today. My hometown of Parkland is a small suburb of South Florida that was considered the safest city in the state for nearly a decade. That all changed in the span of six and a half minutes and a couple dozen rounds of ammunition later. After the fire alarm went off and an active shooter situation was determined, I personally stood for three hours with 19 students and my teacher in the closet of the school newspaper room. All the while, the most painful experience I felt was knowing that my sister sat in the room adjacent to mine, crying underneath her desk on her 15th birthday. Nothing but a thin piece of drywall sat between us. Several of her friends were viciously murdered that day. They were all freshmen. To this day, the sounds of helicopters overhead, abrupt flashing, and the beepings of alarms all triggers my post-traumatic stress. At one point, this became so severe that I was rendered catatonic in my university dorm room during a routine fire drill. 
Despite all these horrors where our government failed to act, my friends and I crafted a response to this tragedy. That response became known as March for Our Lives. We turned our pain into action as we led marches worldwide, conducted multiple nationwide tours, and established over 300 local student chapters across the United States, all in the dedication of raising youth voices and reducing gun violence. Our work aided in creating a gun safety majority in the House of Representatives, but we still have many who ignore or insult our sufferings, both in the Senate and the White House. The young people of my nation know only this reality, one where we have been conditioned to fear going to school, to the movies, restaurants, concerts, offices, places of worship, shopping centers, sporting events, or just plain old walking down the street due to rampant gun violence. We have begun to denote ourselves by generation lockdown due to the overabundance of active shooter drills we face at ages as young as three. Our rights to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness have become alienated to today's youth. The United States has failed to keep its promises to our people, and as a result, more and more people face psychological and physiological trauma, as well as loss or death, all disproportionately affecting communities of color. The U.S. has chosen to accept our deaths as collateral in the face of massive profits from the gun lobby and the military-industrial complex. The students of today represent the America of tomorrow, yet our government values our lives less than green paper. I will conclude my testimony with a quote from the holy text of my faith, the Talmud, whoever saves one life saves the world entire. Thank you. Hi, I'm, Hi, I'm Laura White, and I'm a survivor of domestic violence. Thank you for allowing me to be here today to share my story at this very important hearing. Domestic violence offenders should not have access to firearms. There is actually a federal law in pay, place that's supposed to keep domestic violence offenders from having guns. It is easy to obtain a gun. My ex had a prior felony and should not have had access to a gun. I'm a nine year survivor of domestic violence. I left my ex in late 2009 and filed for a divorce. He contacted me on 11-28-2009 asking me to come to the house and he would sign the papers. I went out to his house on 11-29-2009, not knowing that it could possibly be my last day living. Once I was there, I soon found myself in the back bedroom with a 12-gauge shotgun in my face. He was going to kill me and then kill himself. After when I tried to get away, he stepped back and shot me point blank in the abdomen with that 12-gauge shotgun. After 30 minutes had passed, he finally called 911. When I arrived at the trauma center via a life flight helicopter, the doctor said I had completely bled out. I no longer had a heartbeat or a pulse. They gave me a less than 1% chance of living. I've had 19 surgeries. I lost 80% of my digestive system. I have 30% kidney function and permanent nerve damage that causes me great pain daily. In addition, I have acute PTSD. I've worked very hard on myself with my recovery, but I also know that I will never fully recover from this. My ex got a life sentence, and I got one as well. Studies show that the presence of firearm in a domestic violence situation increases the risk of homicide by 500%. Des despite lives being lost, the government refuses to fund research on the impacts of gun violence and solutions. I stand before you today a strong survivor that has worked every day since I was shot to end gun violence and bring awareness to domestic violence. So here we are today pleading our cases about the need for gun control. I thank you very much for allowing me to speak today. Afternoon, I'm Gregory Jackson, a survivor of gun violence in Washington, DC, but also the National Advocacy Director for the Community Justice Action Fund. Uh, when I was a teenager, on the news I was told that there was a higher likelihood that I would be dead or in jail than to live a full life in the United States. And that bore true um, in more ways than I can count. Um, I've been shot at nearly four times uh, in my lifetime. And on April 21st, 2013, um, I was personally shot. Uh, I was leaving a family celebration, a wedding, and uh, as we were walking home, these two guys got into an argument that exploded into gunfire. And I found myself looking at my family that I grew up with, that I love, um, now running for their lives. Um, luckily, I was the only one shot, um, but that gunshot wound hit two arteries and left me bleeding nearly to death. Uh, in the hospital, uh, the doctor said I only had minutes um, before I would have lost my life due to blood loss. And after 21 days in the hospital, six months 
uh, of recovery, um, six surgeries in a lifetime, I, I imagine, of trauma. Uh, I'm here standing before you today uh, about this issue. Um, while in the hospital, I'll never forget, the nurse shared that every day young black men come through those hospital doors just like me. And even my cousin Tyler, who rode in the ambulance with me when I was shot, uh, this spring lost his best friend to gun violence in Greensboro, North Carolina. In America, over 100,000 Americans are either killed or shot by guns every year. And over 70% of those are black and brown. Uh, people like uh, Micaiah Wilson, who's only 10 years old in Washington, D.C., who was shot uh, leaving her home to buy ice cream. Despite the lives being lost, the uh, government refuses to fund research on the impacts of gun violence and solutions to this crisis. Beyond policing, there are no federal funds invested in gun violence prevention measures um, or uh, programs to support survivors like me. There have been minimal measures adopt to, adopted to protect children both in the school and in their neighborhoods. And the government has done little nationally to enhance oversight of gun licensing or to combat the trafficking of illegal guns into communities that are black and brown like mine. But something must change. Uh, we do not have enough political leaders bold enough to stand up to the gun industry. We do not have enough smart leaders to invest in solutions that we know work. We do not have enough strong leaders to stand up against special interest groups in America. We do not have enough caring leaders to invest in the resources for survivors that need it most. And we do not have enough leaders empathetic to write legislation that will strengthen communities that are devastated by gun violence every day but we have had enough of gun violence in America. And so that's why I'm here today, and so many of us are here today, to hopefully uh, look to you to be those leaders, to hold our government accountable to make the changes needed to save lives every day. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for the opportunity to share my perspective. I am Cleopatra Cowley Pendleton, a proud Chicagoan born and raised. As a child, I recall when the news stories were filled with issues from within low-income, high-crime communities, identifying that someone had been shot, robbed, or sexually assaulted, but those crimes appeared to be in a confined area. Fast forward some years, and the low-income, high-crime communities are torn down, and the people from those communities are displaced around the city. Noticeably, the violence that was once confined became more of everyone's problem. Instead of rebuilding those communities, the individuals moved out, were forced to remain in the foreign, upper, and middle income areas, bringing with them their old mentalities. My daughter is Hadia Pendleton. She part participated in President Barack Obama's second inaugural events as a majorette with her high school band. Hadia returned home excited about her experience and was inspired to participate in politics. However, shortly after returning home, she was murdered, shot in the back on January 29, 2013, while hanging in the park with friends, the majority of which were her volleyball teammates after finishing final exams. Time of death, 3.05 p.m. Dare I ever say that Hadia made a poor choice by going to a Jack and Jill park in an upscale area. That's like saying seven -year -old, the seven-year-old that was shot on Halloween while trick-or-treating was in the wrong place. Or that Lola Leah, who sat on the porch with her mother to get her hair braided, was in the wrong place. Or that Heaven Sutton, age seven, was wrong for selling candy in her front yard to earn money to go to Disney World. In each of those circumstances, including my daughters, everyone had a right to be where they were. Kids like going to the park, young and old. Mothers like bonding with their daughters. And who doesn't love trick-or-treating in Disney World? Everyone has a right to live, dream, and participate in basic everyday activities. As a parent, or as parents, we have a right to see the dreams we have for our children fulfilled. And when those rights are violated, we have earned a right to receive post-traumatic care as a survivor to properly reacclimate us back into society. However, too often the survivors and their families are forgotten. More often, the focus is on rehabil rehabilitating the criminal. But what shift has their careless act of humanity unlocked in the survivor community? More of the same? I am the mother of two. My son, Nathaniel, was 10 at the time of his sister's death. Since her death, he has lost more than nine friends. He's now 17 and a senior in high school. 
It is unfair that he has had to endure a childhood riddled with death. Where is the humanity in that? Thank you for listening. Saludos. Mi nombre es Antonio Tizapa, padre de Jorge Antonio Tizapa, legideño, uno de los 43 estudiantes aparecidos por el gobierno el 26 de septiembre y 27 del 2014. Hace 61 meses que no sabemos nada de nuestros hijos. La idea de este video es para informarle a quien vea y escuche este mensaje, es para decir que ya basta de la compra y venta de armamento de Estados Unidos a México, porque con estas armas desaparecieron a nuestros 43 muchachos y con estas mismas armas que utiliza el Estado y el crimen organizado, ha desaparecido y ha asesinado a miles y a miles y a miles de mexicanos y también con estas armas en México han desaparecido a nuestros hermanos centroamericanos y sudamericanos. Trauma is the disease of energy transfer and bullets are a lethal and violent vector of that energy. In the U.S., nearly 40,000 people lose their lives to bullets each year, an injury pattern which is the second leading cause of death in children. I am a trauma surgeon and have practiced in Baltimore and St. Louis, two cities known for high rates of homicide, most often at the hands of bullets. In adults, though, bullets are twice as likely to cause death by suicide than homicide. As a physician, I see bullets riddle my patients with injuries far worse than the flesh and bones they pierce. I was on call one day last summer when a man presented to me with one of the worst cases of bullets I've ever seen. Despite the diligent work of a team of over 50 nurses, physicians, and technicians in the emergency department, operating room, and the intensive care unit at one of the best hospitals in the United States, Shannon Hibbler died to bullets at the age of 23. His death was only the beginning of the suffering as his family all continued to experience his sudden loss. His daughter, having been exposed to the adverse events at the age of only five, will carry with her a lifetime of health risk. There are others I treat who are left disabled, unable to walk with bags to empty their bow, unremitting pain, and the long-term health consequences of bullet-related violence. Outcomes which are far worse when a bullet and violence are the cause of injury. As a professional and an advocate for health, bullets stand alone in their threat to the wellness of the communities I seek to serve. Their power amplified by the simple fact that the injuries they cause are 100% preventable. Good afternoon. The Whitney R. Harris World Law Institute appreciates the opportunity to appear before the commission today. I am Madeline George, the Senior Research Fellow at the Institute's Gun Violence and Human Rights Initiative. As we have heard today, gun violence in the United States is a crisis. And yet we know that something can be done because we have seen the success of reasonable gun control laws in other countries and in certain U.S. cities. This coalition last testified before the Commission in the, months, or the weeks following the Parkland shooting. Since then, cities and states have passed 110 gun safety laws. And yet these efforts are easily circumvented when individuals can travel to locations with less effective laws. This highlights the need for federal action, and yet the U.S. government has consistently been failing to fulfill its obligations. Although the House of Representatives approved an appropriations bill in June that allocates $50 million to gun violence research, this bill has stalled in the Senate. Likewise, the Senate has refused to hold hearings on two important gun control measures passed by the House in February. One would help close the private sale transaction background check loophole, and the other would give the FBI more time to conduct background checks. Meanwhile, President Trump's primary suggestion to address school shootings is to arm teachers and increase guards in schools. His Secretary of Education has even suggested that schools could use federal education funds for firearms. Uh, Tre President Trump has unsigned the UN Arms Trade Treaty, and his administration has eased export regulations for U.S. gun manufacturers. This will enable dangerous persons to more easily acquire U.S. guns abroad. Although a new rule from the Justice Department effectively bans bump stocks, this is clearly not enough. 
the U.S. government must do more to fulfill its human rights obligations. I would like to request one extra minute. I'll be very, very brief on my statement. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Eugenio Weigen. I'm the Associate Director for the Gun Violence Prevention Team at the Center for American Progress. I would like to thank the Commission for organizing this hearing. The organizations represented at this hearing believe that to reduce these problems, weak gun laws within the U.S. must be addressed. While there's no single solution, a combination of common sense steps would have a significant effect. We request the Commission urge the United States to implement the following policies and actions. Enable federal public health agencies to research gun violence, enact universal background check legislation, ban assault weapons and high capacity magazines, prohibit all domestic abusers from firearm possession and establish protocols for the surrender of those weapons. Support community-based violence prevention and intervention programs. Make extreme risk protection orders available in every state. Pass laws that require individual gun owners to safely store their firearms. Pass the Disarm Hate Act. Reject efforts to increase armed personnel in schools. Reject proposed changes to move the authorization and oversight of firearm export licenses from the U.S. State Department to the U.S. Commerce Department. Establish and implement criteria for end users of legally exported firearms. Many of these proposals have proven to be effective at reducing gun violence as well as gun trafficking. In addition, these common sense steps are widely supported by the U.S. population and in no way violate the U.S. Constitution. Finally, we would like to request the Commission draft a report on gun violence in the United States. This report should include recommendations on how the United States can best address this issue and meet its human rights obligations. We will be submitting to the record an extensive version of these recommendations that include more details. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much to civil society and survivors who came today. I uh, thank you for your strength and courage and for giving up your story to enhance the position that the Commission could use in order to speak with the United States on this matter. I now invite the representatives of the United States to make their response. Thank you very much, Madam President. Distinguished commissioners, colleagues at the other table, and secretariat colleagues. I am Andrew Stevenson with the U.S. Mission to the OAS in Washington, and I'm joined today by Robin Meyer, our Deputy Chief of Mission here at the U.S. Embassy in Ecuador, and uh, Rafael Diaz, our Human Rights Officer here at the U.S. Embassy. Also joined by Thomas Weatherthal of the State Department's Office of the Legal Advisor, and we compromise, uh, we comprise our delegation at this hearing. We will first discuss today the Commission's lack of competence to consider private violence perpetuated by firearms under the American Declaration of, uh, on the Rights and Duties of Man. We will then discuss the constitutional right to bear arms in the United States, U.S. laws and regulations on firearms, and prosecutions of those who violate gun laws. As provided under Article 20 of its statute, the Commission has the competence to examine allegations that the United States, which has not chosen to ratify the American Convention on Human Rights, has failed to live up to its commitments in the American Declaration on the Rights and Duties of Man. The Declaration is one of the key blueprints for the protection and promotion of human rights in the Americas. Despite the importance of the Declaration as a statement of moral and political commitment, the commitments in it are, as the United States' long-standing view is, non-binding. By the same token, the Commission has recommended, recommendatory but not binding powers, as the terms of the Commission statute make clear, in particular Articles 18 and 20. We, of course, understand that the Commission and the Inter-American Court take the view that, dec that the Declaration is a source of legal obligation. Yet, while we have great respect for the Commission and the Court, the United States has never accepted this view and is not bound by it as a matter of international law. While we recognize the good intentions of those who would wish the Declaration had binding force, it would seriously undermine the process of international lawmaking by which sovereign states voluntarily undertake specified legal obligations to impose legal obligations on states where no obligation has been accepted through some form of ipset dixit. This is precisely how this juris jurisprudence originated in the Commission's baby boy decision back in 1981, backed up by a court advisory opinion in 1989. 
Contrary to the commissions and courts' assertions in those two decisions, it is not the case that the states that negotiated and ratified the OAS Charter or its amendments or the states that adopted the commission statute and intended the commission to apply the American Declaration as a binding source of international law. This basic fact holds true no matter how many times the commission restates the view that the declaration has binding force, and it does so frequently. But as far as we are aware, neither the commission nor the court has ever seriously reconsidered the legal reasoning underlying this view. Nevertheless, we continue to make our objections known. As a sovereign state, the United States voluntarily undertakes international law obligations, and it takes those obligations seriously. But we have never undertaken an obligation that would render the Declaration binding, not when it was adopted and not since then. And we have persistently objected to any such notion in scores of written and oral submissions since at least 1979. In sum, the Declaration remains, after more than 70 years, central to the protection and promotion of human rights in the Americas, but as a matter of international law, it also remains non-binding, just as those who negotiated and adopted it intended 70 years ago. While the United States and the Commission disagree on this vital point, we always do so in a spirit of respectful dialogue. And now I'll pass the floor over to Tom. Thank you, Andrew, um, and thank you, members of the Commission, and in particular, uh, members of civil society for your compelling and moving testimony today. Thank you. Regardless of the Commission's view on the legal status of the American Declaration, as the United States argued before the Commission in Lucero versus United States, with few exceptions not relevant here, a human rights violation under international human rights law requires state action. The American Declaration contains no language indicating that declaration commitments extend generally to private, non-governmental acts, and no such commitment can be inferred. The United States thus may not be found to have failed to honor a commitment under the American Declaration for the conduct of private individuals acting with no complicity or involvement of the government. Moreover, no provision of the American Declaration imposes on states an affirmative duty for existence to exercise due diligence to prevent the commission of crimes or civil wrongs by private parties, even where these might undermine an individual's enjoyment of rights in the Declaration. The states that drafted and adopted the Declaration had no intention to create a commitment that would be so open-ended and impossible to implement. Then as now, despite the best efforts of hardworking law enforcement officials, Private individuals commit hundreds of thousands of crimes every year in this hemisphere. Our friends across the table have suggested that the United States government, in connection with gun violence in the United States, has violated a whole range of human rights. However, to the extent that these rights are reflected in provisions of the American Declaration, none of these provisions imposes an affirmative duty upon states to prevent acts by private parties that might undermine an individual's enjoyment of these rights. In arguing that the United States has an affirmative obligation to prevent private acts of violence, as members of civil society rely on incorrect and unduly expansive interpretations of the rights and duties set forth in the American Declaration. To the extent that civil society is arguing international human rights law and the non-binding views of international bodies are embodied in the American Declaration and are, in turn, binding upon the United States, the United States disagrees. More specifically, the United States disagrees with the view that the substantive obligations of human rights treaties can be imported into the American Declaration. And as a legal matter, the United States is also not bound by other obligations contained in human rights treaties to which it is not joined. Nor should any norm of customary international law be applied by the Commission independent of the American Declaration, which, as Andrew explained, is itself non-binding. Importantly, the Declaration contains no language that addresses the implementation of the rights enumerated therein. By contrast, the American Convention, which imposes legal obligations on those states that, unlike the United States, have chosen to ratify or accede to it, includes a provision that describes the nature of obligations of states' parties regarding implementation of the rights enumerated under the Convention. Specifically, in Article 1.1, the American Convention describes an obligation for states' parties to respect the rights protected by that convention and to ensure their enjoyment without discrimination. 
However, the Convention's so-called ensure provision in Article 1.1 has no equivalent in the American Declaration or, for that matter, in the OAS Charter. Relatedly, and as a result, reference to prior reports of the Commission that apply this provision would be an opposite to a state such as the United States that is not a party to the American Convention. Turning now to the substance of the Declaration and the topic of this hearing, there is no article in the Declaration addressing the right of individuals to bear arms, in contrast to the United States Constitution, uh, which provides in the Second Amendment that the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. The constitutional right to bear arms is the starting point for any discussion of firearms in the United States. Furthermore, the Declaration is silent on any right to be free from private violence, including violence inflicted by firearms. More broadly, as we've explained in numerous submissions over the years, the United States does not recognize that OAS member states, by pledging, to support, pledging support for the Declaration or joining subsequent OAS instruments, undertook a commitment, much less an obligation under international law, to prevent private violence. Those who unjustifiably use guns against other individuals certainly fail to respect their duty to obey the law. But there is no provision in the Declaration or in other governing instruments of the Commission that would permit such private conduct to be imputed to the state. Of course, as a matter of domestic law and policy, the United States government takes very seriously its responsibility to prevent and punish crime. However, as a matter of international human rights law, questions of private gun violence and states' regulation of firearms and states' actions to address private violence lie beyond the competence of the Commission. But despite this lack of competence, I'll briefly discuss for the Commission's benefit some aspects of the U.S. domestic legal regime related to the right to bear arms and firearm regulation. As noted above, the Second Amendment of the U.S. Constitution states that, quote, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, end quote. This right has been explained by the U.S. Supreme Court in the case of District of Columbia versus Heller as guaranteeing the individual right to possess and carry weapons. The court also held that this right extends to all instruments that constitute bearable arms, even those that were not in existence at the time of the founding of the United States. The Second Amendment means that governments at all levels of our federal system are prohibited from outright banning ownership, possession, and sale of firearms because to do so would run afoul of the constitutional right to bear arms. And with that, I will turn the floor back to Andrew. Thank you. Uh, however, the existence of the right to bear arms does not mean the governments are powerless to regulate firearm, firearm sale and possession. As the Supreme Court has also recognized, governments may lawfully impose prohibitions on the possession of firearms by, for example, felons and the mentally ill. Governments may also, as two more examples given by the Supreme Court, forbid the carrying of firearms in sensitive places, such as schools and government buildings, and impose conditions on the commercial sale of firearms. Both federal and state laws address firearms possession and use. And the federal government has recently undertaken a number of important efforts to ensure violent offenders, including those who criminally misuse firearms, are held accountable under the law. For example, in March 2017, the Attorney General sent a memorandum to Department of Justice prosecutors ordering them to prioritize cases against the most violent offenders, those who are driving the violence in the most violent places in the United States. In October 19, uh, 2017, the Attorney General reinvigorated the department's Project Safe Neighborhoods program, directing federal prosecutors to partner with law enforcement at all levels of government, along with the communities they serve, to develop localized plans to reduce violent crime. In March 2018, the Attorney General announced new actions to protect U.S. schools, better reinforce U.S. gun laws, support law enforcement, strengthen the firearms background check system, and improve federal law enforcement's response to tips. In December 2018, the Department of Justice issued a rule that applied existing prohibitions against fully automatic weapons to bump stocks, which was noted earlier which enable weapons to fire shots in rapid succession, not unlike fully automatic guns, effectively banning them. In fiscal year 2018, the Department of Justice charged the largest number of violent crime and firearm defendants in its history, including more than 15,300 defendants charged with federal firearms offenses. 
Working with our law enforcement partners around the country, the Department of Justice has seen its combined efforts to fight violent crime pay off. As the violent crime rate fell 3.9% between 2017 and 2018, the U.S. Congress continues to have robust debate on the many proposed additional laws to address gun violence and protect unsafe use and possession of firearms, including proposals concerning background checks and extreme risk protection orders. There has also been activity in this space at the local and state levels. For example, our friends across the table have written that in 2018, 67 gun safety bills were signed into law in 26 states and the District of Columbia. This legislation included bans on bump stocks, so-called red flag bills, and laws limiting the ability of domestic abusers to access firearms. I note these developments to illustrate that the United States government is actively seized with the issue of private gun violence. Branches of the federal government, as well as the states, continue to seriously deliberate and advance measures to address gun violence in the United States. This domestic space is the most appropriate forum for this discussion to continue. International human rights law, for the reasons noted above and previously, is simply not a suitable alternative. Distinguished commissioners, this concludes the state's presentation today, and we look forward to your comments. Um, thank you very much um, to the representatives of the United States. It is now the turn of um, commissioners and the um, vice uh, executive secretary to make comments or uh, put questions to both sides. And I invite my sister commissioner Flavia to set us, set us off. Thank you so much. Good afternoon right now. Thank you so much for the civil society representatives, for the survivors, for the victims of being here. Thank you for the state representatives. Um, I'd like to recognize the importance of this public hearing, focusing on the, the need, the urgent need to reduce gun violence. And I'd like to express my deep gratitude to all of you for the initiative, for your braveness, for your courage, for sharing your suffering, your strength, your hope, with resilience, anger, and hope, and with the hope of, with this belief to make things different and better in a safer and eco, in a place in which everyone could have respect, human dignity, and everyone could be free and equal and equal and free. So um, I'd like to recognize as well all the, all the testimonies, but also all the solid evidence and research which shows that more guns means more violence, as simple as it is. More guns means more human rights violations, preventable death, as we learned here, 100 of them preventable. So um, I'd like uh, to address two uh, concerns to the state representatives. And um, I would honor the principle of good faith international law, considering the American Declaration, and as the state representatives themselves recognize that the, there is the Second Amendment and the, all the, the interpretation given by the Supreme Court, uh, this right to be arm is not illimited, is not absolute, right? So we have the right to life, the right to security, the right to be free from violence, the right to be fr free from discrimination. So in the, taking into account um, this uh, position, the, my first concern um, has to do with specific measures to prevent, to reduce, and to regulate gun violence, especially taking into consideration special protection of the ones who are the target. I mean, all the research and hear the voices, we can see that the the violence has a dis disproportionate impact in women, young, 
African descendant, so we have the special targets of this um, gun violence. So I'd like to, to get this information. I would be pleased to know uh, the concrete measures taken by the state in order to protect, in order to provide special protection. And my second concern has to do with um, the policies, the public policy and the legislation concerning the survivals, because we learn here all the stress, all the post-traumatic stress concerning mental health, concerning all fears. I mean, the one who suffer this brutality, I'd say you can divide the life before and after. There is a new life, a different life after this trauma. And so my question is, um, what is the response of the state in order to provide reparations, rehabilitation, concerning especially mental health and human rights of the ones who survive? Thank you so much, Madam President. Um, before I do my intervention, I invite the Assistant Vice um, Secretary um, to um, assist us with, with this here in relation to the Commission's position, which uh, we have put out on press releases on this issue. Oh, Madam President, um, just to um, state the what the Commission has said uh, in its public statements relating to uh, gun violence over the recent years. The Inter-American Commission on Human Rights has strongly condemned numerous mass shootings in the United States and has repeatedly urged the government to adopt effective gun control legislation to prevent and substantially reduce gun-related violence. Many public venues have become the center of this form of violence, including schools, concert venues, and places of worship. And little has changed in terms of civilian access to firearms. All these latest tragedies again call attention to the urgent need for the adoption of measures that constitute effective gun control policies, along with other measures directed to prevent hate speech in the United States. Now, I'll, I will just add my two cents worth um, in this matter. Um, my one question to the state, Andrew and Tom, thank you. One question to the state is, why has the United States federal government, um, I, and I hope I, it, it is right that the federal government you mentioned, had not done any research on the impact and effect of gun violence on its citizens? Is it because of the strength of the gun industry and lobby? Or is it because the government, federal government, knows the answer, but doesn't want the research results to underline the fact it already knows? And another question. Um, do you accept that as a state, you have a duty to protect your citizens from violence? through your agents um, on the ground as a state. And why does the United States not provide health assistance and treatment from those who have suffered from the failure of the state to protect them against gun violence? And I put this precisely, Andrew, I don't want you to miss my question. <laughs> and I put this precisely. In relation to gun, gun um, um, extrajudicial killings and shootings by the police, and also those that we know of by private citizens suffering from some mental aberration, who were able to arm themselves and arm themselves very seriously. And And also, do, do you accept that the incidence of the private individual's use of guns to inflict violence on their fellow citizens, 
depends on the laws and their implementation of those laws on the ground in relation to the possession and the ability to acquire gun violence. And I'm afraid I belong to a particular group of people. I was born in an ex English colony um, and I went to school in England, boarding school. And so gun violence in the streets is not something I grew up with that, that I know. And I belong to the school of thought that the Second Amendment was wrongly interpreted. We discussed it when I was at university in England. Because it seems that the court forgot the part of during civil strife. There is no civil strife now as far as I know and for years in the US. And yet young people are shot at at schools. Wives are shot at by their husbands who should not have possession of guns. Mothers lose their children throughout. Individuals, young men, uh, especially young black men, uh, in fact have a death mark on their faces. So I don't understand and I wish you could say something to this body that we can understand why only 68 states have passed laws to try and decrease gun violence in the United States. Thank you. Sorry, final comment, civil society would have, what's the time now? Oops, yes, five minutes and the state, five minutes. I'd just like to start by saying that there have been more than 365 mass shootings in the United States this year alone, and the state's testimony is virtually unchanged from last year's hearing, and they have taken no meaningful action, nothing, not even common sense reforms consistent with the Second Amendment, which most Americans support to address gun violence. I would just like to make a quick comment in regards to the state's argument that they cannot be held responsible for private acts. Uh, indeed, this is simply not true. Um, the state may be held responsible when it fails to exercise due diligence to prevent harm, and that is particularly true when the harm is foreseeable and when it affects vulnerable individuals. This is made explicit in several treaties to which the U.S is a party which the U.S. has ratified. This includes ICER, the ICCPR, and the Convention Against Torture. Under the U.S. Constitution, those are the supreme law of the land. This idea has also been consistently held by human rights bodies, including this commission, and human rights courts. Thank you. Just uh, really quickly, I would like to acknowledge that mental health support, support for those in risk of suicide, uh, research against gun violence, uh, violence intervention programs, as well as uh, survivor and victim support do not touch the Second Amendment of the United States in any way, shape, or form, and it is ignorant to claim any way, shape, or form that it does. Uh, along with that, there are many people who are subjected to charity or GoFundMes when they face these acts of violence, uh, whether it is for their own personal medical expenses or for funerals or for just getting by after they might have lost the breadwinner in their family. And that shows a significant lack of support from the state. Uh, along with that, you claim private violence is not your responsibility. I cite for you police violence, which is very apparent in the United States. It is an issue that is yet to be properly addressed on the federal level. And it is honestly an insult to hear that you are using the same exact statistics, the same exact wording of your <laughs> of, of what you have to say over the past couple of years. It is insulting to see that the United States is copy and pasting their work. Thank you for your time. Can I add just one thing? Uh, let's not forget that this is also an issue that goes beyond U.S. borders. From 2014 to 2016, more than 50,000 U.S. guns were recovered in 15 countries in the region, Central America, Mexico, and the Caribbean. 
I'd just like to make a statement, um, talk more about the fact that my ex-husband had a prior felony on his record, and if they had done a background check on him when he purchased the weapon that he shot me with, he wouldn't have been able to do that. And then the impact of my life now, you know, um, I have to live with this. My family, my friends all have to live with this, and I'm not alone in this. This happens constantly, all the time. Yet there doesn't appear to be anything happening to help keep the guns out of the hands of these domestic violence offenders. Thank you. I'd like to say that um, the majority of the crimes that are occurring in the African American communities and brown communities, those people are not obtaining those weapons illegally. So background checks will do something to assist uh, perhaps a population that is um, suicidal. Um, and, and, and give them additional thoughts, something to think about. Um, however, um, <sighs> there has to be something more that's done um, to help families deal with this violence once it's occurred, uh, because we do a lot for ourselves to try and cope. But this is a generational issue. It is not just the in per individual that was murdered that was affected. It's all their families and friends and those um, beyond there. But um, I do want to say this uh, one additional thing. I'm also raising a young black man of color, and uh, it. Um, it causes me conflict when we think about what more could be done as it relates to the laws because there's so much subjectivity with law and there's so much misinterpretation that often we find that when we think we have the right thing, the African-American male is the one that is most likely to um, be victimized by such changes in laws. So I do hope that you take this into consideration when you're thinking about uh, doing something for us. Can, um I just want to address the statistic that violent crime is down. Uh, I don't think over 40,000 people being murdered by guns is something to be proud of. Uh, in my community, a young man named Karan Brown, he held a, peace, a spread peace rally in his neighborhood and was murdered two weeks later at the McDonald's over an argument of a bottle of water. And I can't, I, I would dare you to walk into that community and tell them that these numbers are down with any set of pride. You know, we are looking at a very serious crisis, and when we refer back to the Second Amendment, we, we're really just bouncing around all the solutions that exist. Of the top 30 causes of death, this is the, most, this is the least researched cause of death by the federal government, because they do not want to find the solutions, they do not want to invest in the solutions like hospital-based intervention, like community-based violence intervention programs, like family and survivor support programs They have nothing to do with the firearm but can be reducing gun violence every day. Um, our city council member back home, he has a thing, he says, whenever we say gun violence is down, he says gun violence is down. Yes, it's down the street because that's where we're seeing it. Uh, in cities all over the country like D.C., Milwaukee, Baltimore, Chicago, we are still seeing rising, if not high, rates of gun violence homicide. And I don't think we should ever step back and say the reduction is something to be proud of until this crisis is ended. In my lifetime, I've watched civil rights heroes. I've watched entertainers, celebrities, cultural icons, neighbors, basketball uh, teammates, friends, family, all their lives being destroyed by gun violence. And for us to sit here and say we have done enough or we're doing all we can is just offensive. So thank you. And just re really briefly, just one last comment on uh, the mention of the bump stock ban uh, instituted by the Justice Department. That was done, uh, do that was done so by public comment period. Uh, it was done so by having people from the United States all putting in their comments whether they wanted it to be banned or not. So do not for a second pretend like the federal government was behind that. It was the actions of GVP organizations across the country. I remember I was standing in Minnesota at an event getting 2,000 people to sign that petition. We didn't tell them whether to sign yes or no. We told them to put in their say. So thank you. <laughs> Very much. I now invite the representatives of the United States for the response. Thank you very much, Madam President. Um, I think we'd just like to start by uh, recalling two things. First, we're happy to recall for the Commission's awareness and for our colleagues at the other table that the United States remains a signatory to the 1997 Inter-American Convention against the illicit manufacture of and trafficking in firearms, ammunition, explosives, and other related materials, the SIFTA. 
this is something that we think the Commission very much should take under advisement in terms of recommendations and actions by state parties. We uh, are uh, supportive of the SIFTA process. We're a signatory. We're not uh, a ratified state. But that uh, convention is a binding agreement between countries of the Americas uh, to control and regulate the illicit manufacturing of and trafficking of firearms. So this is something that uh, we have not stressed, but that's something very important in terms of thinking about collaboration among state parties and opportunities, I think, for the Commission to think about the interplay between SIFTA and the inter-American human rights system. So I would uh, open with that and re remind that for you. Um, secondly, we'd like to reaffirm our support uh, for the work of the Commission on the Ayotzinapa, the 43 missing students in Mexico. This is something that we have continued to speak out about um, most recently in September on, on the most recent anniversary. The work of the Commission's uh, group of uh, independent experts is something to be commended. Um, and we, uh, we hope to continue to support the ongoing work of, of that process through the Commission. So I'll turn the, uh, the uh, table over to, uh, to Tom. Thank you, Andrew. Um, just to respond to a, a few questions um, raised by the Commission, uh, the first on specifics about laws adopted at the state and federal levels. Um, obviously, as I noted in our main presentation, in the United States, we begin from the baseline right under our Constitution to keep and bear arms. Um, but I also noted that the federal and state governments have adopted a large number of laws regulating such things as the types of guns and ammunitions that may be sold and the categories of persons who are allowed to purchase and possess them. The precise contours of those laws are limited by the prescriptions of the U.S. Constitution but are otherwise determined by democratically elected legislatures across our federal system. Um, in the exercise of robust representative democracy, different jurisdictions in the United States have chosen different paths. Some have strict laws, while others have less strict laws, but all states have some sort of gun regulation. Uh, questions about how robust these laws should be and what they should cover are within the domain of our domestic um, democratic political process, and as you know, that discourse is active, it's lively, and ongoing. Um, responding to questions of attribution, um, as I'd mentioned before, um, it, it remains a basic tenet of international human rights law that a human rights violation under international human rights law entails state action, and that the American Declaration contains no language indicating that declaration commitments extend generally to private, non-government conduct, and no such commitment can be inferred. Thus, the United States and other OAS member states may not be found to have failed to honor a commitment under the American Declaration based on the conduct of private individuals acting with no complicity or involvement of the government. Um, with specific respect to due diligence, there is no provision in the Declaration that imposes on states an affirmative duty to prevent the commission of crimes by private parties, even where these might undermine an individual's enjoyment of rights in the Declaration. The states that drafted and adopted the Declaration had no intention to create a commitment that would be so open-ended. That said, of course, we, we agree that the loss of life due to illegal or unjustified use of firearms is tragic and abhor abhorrent, and we again look to our democratic processes to continue to improve um, gun laws, gun safety laws, and gun regulations in the United States. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I, um, I am surprised because I think the United States does belong to the Committee of Nations of the world. And there is a standard, I think, a moral code. I'm, I'm assuming your argument is right, which I disagree with. There's a moral code of a duty and obligation of a state to protect its citizens from violence, wherever it comes from, within your state, within your area. That is a, an accepted duty around the world. So I am surprised that you would put that argument before that there is you have a federal state and you, 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 you cannot be held liable for violence from a, a private individual. Of course you are responsible because the duty rests on the state to protect, not on us to protect each other, really. That is a moral and personal belief or action. You don't have a personal belief or action as a state. 
This is an accepted worldwide standard. And, and, and what is going on? 365 mass shootings this year already, and there will probably be more. I take that as there's, there be no real decrease in violent crime in the United States. Because how many victims from those mass shootings? How do you count these figures? Do you count them by the victims? And you ought to because each victim who is hit is a particular crime of violence. That's how you should count them. Not just one well, mass shooting is one offense, it's not. Anyway, we hope that you would take back to the government of the United States that we, the commission, are requesting that they have to, as a federal power, speak to the rest of the states and come to some kind of accommodation to deal with the garden lobby with great strength and commitment. And forget the dollar sign, the dollar paper, and think first of the lives that could be saved. Because there, as, as was mentioned, there's enough evidence in the world that countries which do not arm their police, which the citizens cannot go and get guns in a very easy way, there is not even a millimeter of comparison with the United States in relation to gun violence. So please, save lives. Thank you. Um, we've now come to the end of this hearing. Um, our next hearing is due to commence 30. at 2.30. Thank you. Oh, before I say that, thank you to Ecuador for hosting us, and my greatest thanks to the interpreters who assist so, us so greatly to follow the, the proceedings. Thank you, all of you, for being here, and see you this afternoon. Thank you.